Hello, this is Dr. Helen Weatherly. Welcome to our Gender GP podcast, where we will be discussing some of the issues affecting the trans and non-binary community in the world today, together with my co-host, Marianne Oakes, a trans woman herself and our head of therapies. Great. So I'm really, really, really delighted to um, welcome Susie Green with Marianne and I this morning. Susie is the CEO of Mermaids Charity. And perhaps, Susie, you might be the best person to introduce yourself and what you and Mermaids do. Yeah, my name's Susie Green. I run the charity Mermaids. We support transgender children and young people. I came on board as the first member of staff as the CEO at the beginning of January 2016, but I've been involved with Mermaids for over 19 years as I made my first phone call to the charity when my daughter was six. She's uh, 25 now, which is a bit embarrassing. She's very much grown up. transgender children and young people and their families plus we also do a lot of work with professionals supporting trans kids as well including delivering training into schools and supporting GPs that sort of thing. Brilliant well it's lovely to hear of your work so so Mermaids has been going quite a long time then you know which would be if if, uh, your daughter's um, 25 and and you phoned the helpline when you were six so that kind of goes against this this idea that this is a newfangled thing Susie which I'm sure you get thrown at you quite a lot from the kind of people who don't understand it quite so well. Yeah, I'm, I knew nothing about gender dysphoria when Jackie told me when she was four that God had made a mistake and she should have been a girl. I think I found a paragraph in a book talking about girly boys and it was only really a couple of years later when it wasn't going away that I decided I need to find some help for it. And I did an, an internet search, I think it was Ask Jeeves, which is embarrassing, but never mind. And about halfway down the page was was... Everything else was nonsense, but Mermaids was um, was there and, and it had a helpline number in it. And I phoned and, and spoke to Lynn, who was one of the founder members. I mean, Mermaids has been around since 1995 and was pulled together from a group of parents who were attending the Tavistock, which is the NHS service. So no, this isn't something new. I would say that finding support and finding help back then was much more difficult than it is now, obviously within the internet being so much more accessible but I don't think it's any more prevalent now I think it's just that people feel that they can talk about it whereas back then it was it was really very very hard. Yeah I mean I still find working with children and families amazingly rewarding but but completely heartbreaking at the same time you must see some well I guess both ends of the spectrum stories really is that is that how it is for for mermaids? We see people coming into, so when people phone the helpline or come through the email service, then we offer them access if they want it. For children and young people, for younger children, it's generally the parents group and the parents join. For teens between 12 and 19, they can join our youth group as well. But what we do see on our youth group is we see a lot of young people who aren't supported by their parents, who don't have any way that they can talk about this other than online and we want to provide a safe space for that because we know that there are a lot of predators out there who who would love access to vulnerable young people like this so mermaid is a safe space for parents we have parents with kids as young as three and four up to and including 19 on joining our groups and it's again it's that safe space to talk about how you're feeling we have parents who come in and and they're devastated We have other parents who come in who say that they've known this for some time and it's just taken their child actually opening up and talking to them. So we have people at very different stages coming in at all times. And, you know, from a couple of hundred parents at the beginning, which there were when I joined all those years ago to to now, we've got nearly 1,500 parents on our parents group and that's growing by between 40 to 80 people every month. Really? Wow. One of the things, while you were just talking then, we're talking about mermaids being in existence from 1995. And I'm wondering how you've noticed the dynamics changing in terms of trans boys over trans girls and the numbers. Has that changed within mermaids or is that just a public perception? It has changed within mermaids. So when we first started, well, without before me, when the um, charity first started, it, all of the parents had children who were assigned male at birth who identified as female. So there weren't any trans boys. And I'd say that that probably 
you know, continue that the trans boys we'd see coming in at sort of teenage years really only started, I'd say, about 15 years ago. But I mean, I've got my sort of theory for that. I think that kids who are assigned male at birth who identify as female and prefer what are stereotypically considered to be girly things, it that's much harder and they get quite a lot more resistance. So the likelihood is that this would be noticed and acted on a lot younger. Whereas kids who are assigned female at birth who don't identify as their birth gender, whether it's because they identify as as male or identify as non-binary, those kids, you know, they're allowed to be tomboys and nothing is ever really thought of it. So I yeah. think that's we see more of those young people coming to us in their teenage years when puberty starts, because up until that point, they've just been allowed to be, whereas it's not really the same for girly boys. Gender expression when they're younger, is, it definitely seems to be easier for the trans boys. They, they, they kind of just, I think people are kind of more accepting of, um, dare we say, a young girl that's presenting masculine and nobody's really questioning it. But when it's a boy, it does seem to raise flags earlier, doesn't it? It does, and I think that's why that we, we do see that families who contact us when their children are younger, it, it's generally because they are assigned male at birth and identify as girls. I think it's not acceptable in society. I think it's picked up much earlier, and I think that, you know, I mean, we do see trans boys, younger trans boys, but, but not as many. And I think, yeah, you, you're completely right in so far as that it's not seen as being acceptable. And... I think there's a lot of, you know, patriarchy in our society and this goes against it. Kids that, that don't want to be male and, and are saying that they aren't male and this is who they are. That creates and it creates much more friction in families as well. The majority of cases where, where dads are having a real issue and it's mainly the dads, sometimes mums, but mainly the dads, that generally is because a child is identifying as female. Susie, you mentioned there the, the parents who aren't able or don't feel able to support their children and the children therefore come to you without that support. You know, we obviously at Gender GP see that same scenario coming through. And I, I don't know about you, Marianne, but they're always very difficult. You know, we so wish that the parents were there through their whole journey. So what advice would you give to parents, to those children, to us, to other supporters of, of trans families? I think the main thing, and this is this has also been borne out by um, international research and international guidelines, is that listen to your children and try not to get too caught up in what the eventual outcome will be, but support them in the here and now, because that means that you will have a relationship with your child where you can have those open and frank conversations. And so if things do shift, then they'll be able to talk to you about it. But when you shut your kids down, then the likelihood is, is that that's going to damage your relationship with them regardless. And you know, I, I have seen families where children have identified either as non-binary or identified as other than their birth gender and with the right support and with a really open, honest dialogue all the way through, have at some stage decided that that's not for them. Yeah. I think we've got to accept, you know, we, uh, you're right, Susie, we've got to support them in the here and now. And I think one of the obsessions is what if they change the mind? The trouble is, if we don't deal in the here and now, the effects of that carry on through the life, doesn't it? For example, you know, once they start with severe mental health issues, for example, they don't just disappear when the 16 that can carry on through the life as well you know the example uh, eating disorders which i see a lot with young trans boys and once you've got an eating disorder that isn't something that just disappears it stays with you for life like any addiction i suppose yeah and i think the thing is as well with, with all of that is that you know as soon as you get into a situation where you're shaming your child for the way that they feel about themselves and who they think they are then that can't be a good thing. And, you know, that's borne out by studies in terms of that if a child is supported, then their mental health increase, you know, their mental health and well-being increases, that there's definitely a drop in suicidality and self-harm. But if, as you say, you know, if they start those behaviours, they're, they're then very difficult to drop. So I think it's just really about making sure that you're listening and listening and hearing them, not just listening and then, you know, dismissing. 
and that it's okay to change your mind at any time. You know, I think one of the things that concerns me sometimes is that children feel pressured to keep moving forward because, again, they're frightened of, of actually talking to the parents about what's happening. And it's okay to go in stages. But when I work with some of the children, you do get a sense that they, they want to talk to the parents. It isn't that they're not questioning the gender identity it's just that things are moving too fast sometimes being able to have an open dialogue without fear of judgment I think would be really important I think I've seen this where parents have just got so sort of caught up with wanting to have a definitive answer as to what is going to happen how it's going to happen and and to be sure and sometimes you can't be sure this is too complex an area, especially for kids who, you know, who who are trying to work out their way through. And I, I see this a lot with sort of the young people who are assigned female at birth. It may be that they go through stages, including identifying as non-binary, then they may go more transmasculine, then they may go back to being non-binary, or they may decide that being female is, is fine for them, um, but they define how they live as female and they don't do it based around stereotypes. And being able to challenge those stereotypes is really important. But it's around, and I know kids often feel that if they've put their parents through so much already by transitioning and their parents have been supportive, that then saying, this isn't what I want anymore, is actually quite hard. So it, this is all about listening and constantly allowing that evaluation. But at the same time, if you've got a kid who's saying, this is who I am, you don't need to question them over breakfast every morning as to whether or not this is how they feel today, so. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, you hit up and that nail on the head there, that, it, that, that, that growing up from naught to, well, you know, I'm nearly 50 and I'm still still understanding myself. It's, it's, a, it's a continually changing process, isn't it? How you feel, how your sexuality feels, how's it, how your identity feels, how your pol political view feels, how, how you want to express yourself in the world next week or last week. And, you know, gender is no different, you know, and particularly as these children are growing up, I think that exploration is really, really important. And we see lovely, lovely, lovely children who, who one month have done a complete, you know, short hair, absolutely everything masculine. And the next month they're like, actually, do you know what? I'm just going to see what it's like to wear some makeup today, like my friends are wearing. And what is wrong with that? It don't, we don't need those alarm bells. Oh my goodness, change of mind here. Have I done the wrong thing as a parent? Have I done the wrong thing as a doctor? Have I done the wrong thing as a, as a teacher? You know, I think allowing these children to explore their gender in, a, in an uninhibited way has got to be, a, you know, our vision for the future, really. Susie, I, I, for the benefit of our listeners, you mentioned the, the, the non-binary word there a few times. I know it's a tricky thing to understand. It's tricky for me to understand sometimes. It's tricky for parents, for friends. Uh, do you mind kind of in, in your experience giving, giving your snapshot view on, on how that feels to be non-binary for, for a child to be non-binary? Yeah, I'd say that it's really only been over the last sort of five years that, that young people have been expressing themselves more openly in this way and I think what what I've seen is young people who are saying actually I, I'm I don't identify with my assigned birth gender but I also I'm not going all the way over to the other side either and and refusing to be defined by the, the binary we know within biology that that gender isn't binary we know that sexuality isn't binary so i think that this is young people actually saying this isn't this is not who i am i don't fit as male and don't fit as female so actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to live in that space in between and i think the main thing is people seem to have massive confusion around what that means and you know oh you you're a boy or you're a girl and actually there's lots and lots of conditions where there's chromosomal issues, there's hormone issues, you know, where, where that isn't as, as straightforward. But I think the, the bottom line for these kids is that they're going, I'm not going to let anybody else define me. This is myself and I'm going to define me. And my major overriding concern is when people try to say, no, you've got to be one or the other, is that what difference does it make to anybody else? Because all that that young person is saying is, is that I'm not going to fit into a binary what difference does that make to me? What difference does that make to you? It makes none whatsoever. But if it makes them comfortable and makes them happy, 
then they're not hurting anybody else. So why shouldn't they be supported to be themselves? Yeah, but I mean, I think, again, you, you hit the nail on the head right at the end there for me. You know, if they're not hurting anybody else, you know, what is the difference? You know, to, to those people that would judge families, judge young people, judge those who support trans people, you know, if, no harm is being done to, to the outside world here. Um, you know, let's let people live the way that they that is comfortable for them and for their world. And then you people like Mary, Marianne and I and, and you Susie and, and, the, and the organisations we work with can support that. Talking about the kind of medical support Susie, if you had a, a beautiful rose painted picture of the future, how, how would medical support for families and children be in the future? I've just got back from WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. They held their 25th anniversary conference in Buenos Aires. And the thing that really struck me there was actually how proactive many of the American clinics are. And if we could have the same kind of care as is provided in Washington and California, you know, their wait list is like three to four weeks. And then in terms of assessment, et cetera, that, that young people go through, that can take a few weeks at the moment, you know, the, the current services within the UK with 18 months as a, as a minimum wait time at the moment, young people are held in limbo in a situation where their bodies are often changing and they're in massive distress. And I know that this is due to an overwhelming rise in numbers. But I also think that it needs to be a really, you know, a really good look at services and how they're run to actually work out ways to make them more responsive and to get rid of that wait time, which is which is incredibly damaging. So on the converse of that is is the criticism that maybe children are being pushed through too quickly. Is that a possibility? Well, that isn't borne out by the research and it isn't borne out by the data. Um, I think that if you have an assessment that is thorough, then I don't I don't see that that, that can really be pushed, you know, that, that sort of narrative can be pushed because we know that kids and young people who come, you know, access services, the likelihood is that they have known for some time before they've maybe disclosed that to their parents, or maybe the parents have known for some time and have been waiting for their child to talk to them. I mean, let's be clear as well, not nothing is given prior to puberty. So if a parent with a six-year-old went to a clinic and said, you know, my child is expressing as female or my child is expressing as male or, or as, as neither and, and is non-binary, then the fact is no intervention, no medical intervention would be given in any case to that child until they, until they had reached the beginning stages of puberty. So first off, there's nothing other than social transition, which is non-medical for younger children anyway. And for kids who in, are in the beginning stages of puberty or, or maybe this feeling of gender dysphoria has become more apparent for them as they're going through puberty, the main thing is around arresting the development of the secondary sexual characteristics because those are the things that cause the massive distress to young people. Their bodies change and their bodies are different to the way that they feel and, and who they are, a gender dysphoria diagnosis would not be given at the drop of a hat. The assessment needs to be well done and it needs to be thought through, but there's nothing to say that it can't be done quickly to deal with the very genuine need that these kids have. Yeah, I think for me the most distressing and then the most rewarding children that, that we have seen are those who have had to endure puberty and the changes that just march on every day. And there seems to be nothing that that child can do to stop those changes happening. And that, that very often that child is withdrawn into their bedroom, out of school, out of they don't go and play on the street. They don't present themselves to their friends anymore. They kind of hide in their bedroom, hide behind their computer screen with a, a different anime icon that they use to portray themselves. And then once you actually start medical intervention and stop those 
change is happening and get that child's confidence back again. And the child comes, starts talking again and comes out of their bedroom and starts reintegrating with society. I mean, that for us is just so wonderful. And, you know, that's, that's what we've got to really, really continue to fight for in medical care. And, and I'm sure, Marianne, you, you get to see a lot of that joy, don't you, when, when, you know, when working with people. I think um, I, I sometimes message you, don't I, Helen, when I've spoken to some parents and it's reflected to me that I'm the first person they've spoken to that's not tried to catastrophize what's happening or, you know, be the voice of doom, that it's just a friendly voice. And sometimes it's the first friendly voice and it's the first time that they've had some hope. And, you know, just that in itself, cause as you were talking before, I was just thinking about when we're talking about prepubescent children, actually supporting the parents to prepare them for what might be coming up and to help them to help their child. I don't know what you think, Susie, but it just feels like there isn't a lot out there. Practical help, you know, how do we create a good environment for a trans child who's socially transitioning to feel empowered, to feel, you know, to keep the self-esteem? You know, we do see families with, with very young children and our job is not to tell them whether or not their child should transition. Our job is not to tell them whether their kid is trans or not, that, you know, that we're there to support the family and we're there to give them the tools and the information to actually work their way through this and work out what's best for them. One of the things that um, I'm involved in is the standards of care that are used globally to treat children, young people and and adult trans people are being revised at the moment and I'm on the new children's chapter and it is so much a part of the ethos around these clinicians who are from all around the world and I'm in that group as a stakeholder as supporting and representing parents is not to get too caught up in the eventual outcome but as I said before you know you, to support the child in the here and now to make sure that they feel listened to to make sure that they feel supported to be themselves and to make sure that their environment is a supportive environment and there is a very very strong push against what's called reparative therapy or conversion therapy which is when you try to encourage or to force a child to live as their birth gender and to ignore their feelings of gender dysphoria And that's been, you know, that's been roundly condemned and has been picked up on as being extremely harmful. Whether the child turns out to be trans or not, listening to them is incredibly important in terms of the attachment to parents and the and the way that they live in the world. That's an interesting uh, question as well, you know, whether they are trans or not. And I suppose it is just about allowing them to discover you know, what are their feelings actually saying to them rather than trying to interpret them for them? Have you understood that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Because the fact is, is that we live in such a gendered society that, you know, the, the stereotypes around how children should express themselves means that if somebody steps outside that norm, even a little bit, then it's generally picked up on. And I think we need to be breaking down those barriers and, and allowing kids to, to explore without feeling shamed. And we should allow kids to have a freedom of expression without being shamed. Now, the fact is, is that gender variance is very different to kids who suffer with gender dysphoria. And the kids who suffer with gender dysphoria are the ones who are insistently, persistently and consistently saying, this is not who I am. I am a boy or I am a girl. And it tends to be much more binary in younger children. But what I have seen sort of like over the years of, of sort of working with families and sporting families is that some kids who start out very binary, when they realize that actually they are supported to be themselves and that gives them the freedom to explore and gives them the freedom to be able to think about who they are. And it may be and that their expression isn't quite so extreme in one way or the other, but teenagers tend to be much more fluid. Yeah, and I think that brings me back um, 
and I think for the benefit of our listeners, that, that the, the really important point you made earlier, Susie, which is when these children are, are, are working this out, working out where they fit on this, on this gender spectrum, medical intervention is not having long lasting effects. So we may have paused puberty by using puberty blockers just to give that time in, in early teenage years, give that time to see you know, whether a full male or a full female puberty is going to cause big problems for that person later in life. But medical intervention in terms of, of sex changing hormones or sex changing surgery, as, as we see so, so often written in the, in the newspapers, is a much later step, isn't it? Once, once a lot of this exploration has been done. And you know, a lot of these children that, that we see are screaming and crying just for a very simple intervention, which is, please, can you just stop my puberty and give me a breathing space? Give me and my family and my school and my friends and my environment a breathing space so that I can work out what the best place is for me. And those puberty blockers are reversible. You know, you can stop for them and puberty just carries on as it would as it would have done naturally if that's what the right thing is for that child. I think we see so much of the relief in terms of young people when they are given the opportunity to pause their puberty so that they're not living through the changes that they, you know, they abhor. Not least with my own daughter, who as soon as her male puberty began to, to make its effects, she felt she st actually started cutting herself. And when we couldn't get the puberty blocking medication in the UK at that point because the NHS didn't arrest puberty until 16, which would have been too late for her. She told me that, you know, she would rather be dead than lose her voice and, and have facial hair. And she was terrified. And as I say, as soon as that began, she began to cut herself. So for me, finding a doctor, which, you know, ended up being in, in Boston, to, to stop and give her that space and that time was of absolute paramount to me. And I, don't, I really don't believe that she would have made it through a male puberty if I had taken those steps. I think as a, as a doctor, when I, when I see, a, a, you know, when we take a history from a person, you know, we say, you know, what medical problems have you got? Um, do you smoke? Do you drink? What medication are you taking? And I look at the list of medication that these young people are on, you know, the antidepressants, the antipsychotics, the, the tranquilizers that these young people are being prescribed by their mental health services. When actually the young person in the family is saying, please, could I have a blocker? And it's, no, you're not having a blocker because we don't know if that's the right thing for you. But here you are. Here's all of this, these really strong medicines. And I just I just want to pull every hair in my body out because what, 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 I, why can't people just see it? Give the child the blocker that stops the pubertal development and you won't need those other drugs. The anxiety, the depression, the stress will, will lessen and, and give that child a chance. You know, and we, we've got a lot to learn in our country about that. And I think it's really refreshing to hear you talk about you know the views of international figures and international centers such as those that, that we heard at the WPATH you know it's really good to see that times are changing and hopefully we in the UK will be able to follow their example um, soon uh, which would be which would be lovely. Well I'm hopeful that the new guidelines will be sort of in around a year I think it is sort of the target they're doing some um, systemic systematic reviews at the moment and but what is really striking is the clinicians that are part of um, both the children's chapter and the adolescent chapter are very clear that, that it is so important to keep the dialogue open and to continue to talk to your child and, and to make sure that they understand that you love them regardless and that your love is not based around a predetermined, that you're not saying, I will only love you if, that it is, I will love you whatever. I understand how difficult it is to not have certainty around this and parents and, and I was one of them just wanted to know what would happen so actually letting go of that is really hard. Interestingly enough I've had I've spoke with parents that have recoiled I think would be the right word at the at the Tavistock because they feel when they go there that the control or the support they can give their child is taken out of their hands, that they have absolutely no say or control over it. And it's difficult for me because I've never been involved with the Tavistock, but 
I'm just wondering whether that's something that parents fear as well, that that actually this is something that we, you, you know, your child's talking about something that you can't even get your head around. You know, you can't, we've been conditioned to feel it, you know, and think in a certain way. And now your ch- child is challenging all of that. You know, it's not just the loss of control of parenting, shall we say, or the inability to, to be able to, you know, be the parent in that situation. But also then we hand over to other services, like we're handing our child over. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we, we get mixed reports with regards to the Tavistock clinicians and, you know, some really, really great relationships uh, have been forged, but the ones that seem to work the best are the ones where the parents are supported as, as well as, as the young people. So it's it's sort of like a collaborative approach, a whole family approach, and also looking at the environment that that young person is as well. Because the majority of the problems that my daughter had were outside of the home. It was the school environment, the local environment, and the amount of prejudice that, that she received in, in those spaces. And as hopefully as uh, trans kids and, and trans young people and transgender people in general are, are more visible, then it will become less of an issue. But I think that we've still got a long way to go. And I think that hopefully international guidelines and international best practice will permeate through our health services as well as those globally to actually make it you know, a, a better place, a better world for trans people. I think, Susie, one of the most beautiful um, memories and images I have of your mermaids residential courses is of sunshine and children of all ages just happy, skipping, kicking footballs, laughing, painting, getting dirty, um, having fun. It doesn't matter what they're wearing. It doesn't matter what they look like. You know, they are just free um, and, and, as I say, you know, skipping and laughing without any, any external judgment, just wonderful support. And, you know, that has got to be our future inside mermaids residentials and outside of them um, in the future. You know, we've just got to let these young people and their families just be free, be happy, express themselves how they want to, wear what they want to, identify as they want to. If they need some medical help along the way, I think we need to listen to the family and listen to the child at what medical help they're needing from us. And then in society in the future, we will have a lovely cohort of, of young and middle-aged and older adults who on the outside, it, 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 you can't tell whether they were assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth or, or whatever. And, and does it actually matter? And, you know, the integration in society is, is just there and accepted. I think we are sort of 20 years behind the, the gay movement and a lot of the arguments that are being used in, in the papers um, against transgender children and young people and, and particularly trans women as well are all the sort of things that you heard about Section 28 the narrative around kids that, that's been put out with regards older trans children grooming younger trans children is exactly the same things that were being said about other gay children grooming other kids to be gay. And, and it's all based around that moral hysteria over something that's not actually happening. And it's also really highly offensive to trans kids because that language in itself is, is implies some level of uh, you know child abuse and i just think it's disgusting that adults who have nothing to do with this it's not going to affect their life it's not going to affect what they do tomorrow the day after believe that it's okay to to target kids and and to label children with such offensive offensive narratives it it really it it ju- i am completely bemused by the fact that people think that that's okay what I would say is just looking at my own experience of how it was growing up in the 60s and 70s and I look how it is now. Yeah, it has come forward leaps and bounds and there is conversation around this now, but it's the tone of the conversation that's disturbing. It's great that we are able to be here talking about this and I'm sure, Susie, you've seen since 1995, was it, the changes in this whole subject but like I say, it's about changing the tone. Yeah, we are talking about it. There is help out there. We've got to change the tone of the conversation if we can. I think we need to be looking at the positives. We need to be looking at 
actually the positives that come around when you listen to kids and you allow them to, to just be themselves and what a difference that makes in their day-to-day -day existence, how much happier they are, which means that, you know, they will grow up to be good friends. They'll grow up to be good parents. They'll grow up, you know, to be good people because they've had the needed support when they, when they needed it. You know, you make people feel bad about their very selves. What are you going to do other than engender shame and self-loathing? And it just is so obvious to me. I, I just don't understand why people have this massive moral panic about whether or not a child is trans or not. It just I say, I just, I just find it really troubling as to why people are so invested in something that's never actually going to make any difference to their lives whatsoever. I think, you know, I totally agree. And it, and it is abhorrent. It's disgusting. And, you know, the, the wider society who is allowing it needs to take some action. I always say, you know, whenever an article is written or, or a tweet is put out or a Facebook post, the comments that are allowed underneath it are just hideous and shocking. We would never be allowed to write that about black people or Christian people or gay people or any other minority group. Yet these comments about transgender people and about transgender children go unmoderated, go allowed, go applauded. And, you know, someone out there needs to take some responsibility for this and stand up and shout and say, no, you know, this is not acceptable behaviour. I agree. Unfortunately, the regulation around social media, the regulation around what's in the printed media is, well, it's just not there, is it? I mean, um, Ipso had 8,000 complaints in one year, and I think they upheld one. I don't know. Um, I don't know where it starts, but I think it would help if the politicians would be outraged. You know, it isn't about whether they understand or not, but like we say, it's the language that's used that we should be outraged about, and we should, you know, be allowing the professionals to do their job and stop this demonization i suppose I, I can't help but feel it needs to start with the politicians i might be wrong but i think it's i think it come it needs to come from both areas i think it needs to come from the law it needs to come from mp's and the government and it also needs to come from regulation and standards in terms of journalistic standards that are sadly lacking uh, which means that um, Anybody who has got any kind of anti-trans narratives feels entirely comfortable attacking trans kids and trans women because they know that nothing is going to be done about it. Well, I mean, certainly for our listeners today, I'm hoping that we get lots of discussion, lots of comments, lots of, of shared narratives and shared stories. You know, I'd love to hear other people's ways that they've managed to support someone that they knew was trans or, or how, you know, a trans family or a trans life affected their world and how they managed to, to, to navigate through. We don't want any of the nasty comments at all. Uh, what we want is, is a future way to to educate there's a massive need for education and understanding and, and Susie you've shared so much of your knowledge today and I thank you for that we need to edu educate children educate families educate those people in the street who've never met a trans person but feel yet that they can comment on it you know you, you your organization does wonderful work in schools to help that anti-bullying and you know I think the future is going to be rosy and you know certainly I'm looking forward to seeing so many more trans children skipping happily um playing football happily uh, jostling and and knocking around together with with kids of all types um whatever that type might be um and i think that's the, the rosy future of of trans children who will then turn into beautiful and well-adjusted trans adults yeah agreed. and that's what needs to happen Thanks so much, Susie, for coming on today. It's been really, really lovely to have you. And I applaud heavily the work that you and mermaids do. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed our programme. Do go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you or anyone else are affected by any of the topics discussed in our podcast and you'd like to contact us, please drop us a line at doctor at gendergp.co.uk. We're very happy to accept ideas for future episodes and guests or if there's something specific you'd like us to cover. You can also visit our website www.gendergp.co.uk You can follow us on social media at GenderGP and you can sign up to our monthly newsletter. 
Proof of full details can be found in the show notes on our podcast page. Thanks for listening.